Hello everybody and welcome back to another video. Today I'd like to talk about the Colpitts oscillator once again and in lieu of using an op amp as we did in video number 72 we're going to be using a transistor to give us the amplification we need to get the circuit into oscillation. So we'll look at how to set it up, what the voltages are going to be on the base and the emitter, look at the transconductance determine what the gain of the circuit will be, look at the frequency of oscillation for our tank circuit, look at its feedback factor or its attenuation, and see how all of this works together to give us a stable frequency out on our device. We'll also be checking everything out on a breadboarded circuit. I've already built that here. And we'll look at how the Barkhausen criterion is correct most of the time with the exception of the gain greater than one. We'll explain that as we as we get farther into the video. So let's go ahead and get started. Well let's get this started by looking at the actual tank circuit and that's going to consist of L1, C1, and C2 and for simplicity we'll just combine these into one total capacitance and we'll call it CT and we'll have our inductor in parallel and there's going to be some frequency at which both the value for the capacitor, CT, where the XC value and the XL value are going to be equal. And of course this is resonance for this particular or for these particular values. And what's going to happen is we'll apply a pulse of of current or voltage to our circuit and our capacitor is going to charge and we remove the pulse and let's just say that this is the polarity that we charged at. Once that pulse is gone the capacitor doesn't like to see a change in voltage to what's applied to it so it's going to attempt to keep it constant. It's going to discharge and it will discharge through the inductor and that inductor then of course is going to build up a magnetic field and eventually the capacitor is going to discharge completely. The inductor's magnetic field then will be as large as it can get. As soon as it senses a drop in the applied current the magnetic field collapses and it induces the voltage back into the circuit in the opposite direction and we can thank Faraday for discovering that and that charges the capacitor again so we end up having a a loop that keeps feeding these two components and we're going to start out at a maximum value and then we're going to eventually go to zero and damp out and the objective with the transistor circuit is to keep the circuit from damping out and keep it at a constant amplitude so we're going to have to find out what that frequency is and then we'll take a look at how that amplitude is maintained so let's clean this up a little bit and move on We'll just go straight down the list of all of the calculations and the first thing we're going to look for is what our frequency of oscillation is going to be. And for that we need a value for C, but there are two capacitors here. And these capacitors are in series. So we remember that when we have capacitors in series, it isn't possible to add the two capacitors together. We have to take into account the distance between the plates and uh, dielectrics etc. But let's say that these two dielectrics were exactly the same. We can also assume, and rightly so, that the voltage at these two points, there's no difference. So it's zero volts. So essentially these two plates are, are one and the same. We can take them out of the circuit. And then we can imagine ourselves sliding those two plates together that are left and just maintaining the distance that we had originally between this plate and this plate. So let's say we had two here and three here, so a distance of two from here to here and a distance of three from here to here. Slide the two together and we have one capacitor now with a distance of five. And that distance of five, of course, because the plates are farther apart, the capacitance goes down. So you can see how we can't add these two together. We're going to have to use product over the sum. And with that, we're going to end up with 4.7 nanofarad times 33 nanofarad over 4.7 nano 
nanofarad plus 33 nanofarad. And the result is going to be 4.114 nanofarad. So there's our, our total capacitance. And we can plug that into our equation. And we have a 100 microhenry inductor times 4.114 nanofarads, square root, 2 pi, etc., 1. And we get a frequency of 248.13 hertz, or kilohertz. If you know your starting capacitance or your starting inductor, you can always calculate the value for the other one. The way that would be done is, is that we go back to our original principles again. We know that XL is 2 pi F times the value of the inductor. And we know that XC is 1 over 2 pi FC. And at resonance, these two values have to be equal to each other. So let's say we wanted to find the value of of L. We would divide this side by 2 pi F and then we would have 2 pi F over here as well. We have to keep everything balanced. So these will cancel and we'll be left with L is equal to 1 over 2 pi F and that would be squared. We could also say 4 pi squared F squared, but that gets a little bit cumbersome, so this is just an easier way to write it. And then we would have, of course, the value for C. So in this case, uh, if we knew that we had 4.114 nanofarad, and we wanted a frequency of 250 kHz, we could just plug these values into the formula and find out what value of inductor we would need. And of course, we could do it exactly the same way for a capacitor. Just be C is equal to 1 over 2 pi F squared L. So it would work either way. And that's actually the way that I came up with the values for my 250 kHz oscillator. Well, let's see if 248.13 kHz does give us a frequency at which XL and XC will be equal to one another. And plugging our values in, so 2 pi, the frequency of 248.13, and our inductor of 100 micro, we will get 155.907 ohms, I believe. And doing the same thing, for, but this time for our capacitors, but this time we have to do it twice. We have to do it for, we have to find the value for XC1 and XC2. And the sum of these two should equal 155.907 if that 248 kHz is our resonant frequency. So doing XC1 first, we would have 1 over 2 pi 248.13 K times 4.7 nano and we get 136.47 ohms. For the other one, I'm going to run out of space here, I'll just put the result down and that was 19.43 seven ohms. So if I add the two together, 136 and that's about 20, so that's going to be 156 and a little bit over, so you can see that they're they're almost going to be spot on to that. So this is indeed the resonant frequency for the values of capacitance and inductance I have in the circuit. The next thing we can do is find the attenuation or feedback factor of our circuit. And that's just given by C1 over C2. So we are going to have 4.7 nano over 33 nano. And I'm just going to leave the nano off since they're going to cancel. And we will get a feedback factor of 0 
4. Now a lot of people look at the circuit and say that C1 is not an attenuation, it's the output, and C2 is at the actual part of the circuit that gets fed back in. And you are correct, but you have to remember that the bigger this capacitance is, or the smaller this capacitance is, the bigger its reactance is going to be. C1 is the voltage that we're going to see at the output over here. And C2 is the voltage that actually gets fed into the transistor circuit. But remember that C2 has a much larger capacitance, so its total reactance is smaller than 4.7. Just to put that another way, if we go back down to our numbers, we had 19.437 ohms for C2, and we had 136.47 ohms for C1. So you can see that C1 is going to be is quite a bit larger, and it's going to give us a larger voltage at the output, and we're only going to feed a small fraction of the voltage, only 19.437 ohms divided into 136.47, into the input. So it's an inverse proportionality. So what we do is we just leave it as 4.7 uh, 4 ohms, or C1 divided by C2. We could just as easily have said XC2 divided by X. C1. And that would give us 19.437 over 136.47. And guess what that's going to give us? The exact same thing, 0 0.1424. So it's just easier to, to leave it like this because we know that it's an inverse proportionality and uh, well, it's just easier that way. So C1 divided by C2. Again, you can do it with X, the capacitive reactances, and just flip that around, and it'll work just as well. So let's clean this up and start working on the biasing of our circuit. To analyze the actual voltage gain of the device, we're going to have to find out what the voltage on the base is, because we're going to need emitter voltage to get emitter current. So we start out with our voltage divider bias formula, and you guys have probably seen this plenty of times. So we're looking at 10K over 47K plus 10K times 10 volts. And we're going to get a voltage on the base of 1.75 volts. We know that on the emitter we're going to have 7 tenths of a volt less than we had on the base because we need to forward bias the device and that will give us 1.05 volts on the emitter. Now that we have 1.05 volts, so we know the emitter voltage, we can just use Ohm's law and 1.05 divided by the 1.2k ohm resistor RE will give us a current of 875 microamps. All right, now we can use GM to get the gain of our circuit, and some of you may be using that regularly. Uh, some of you may be using R prime E or REJ to get the gain of a circuit. Notice that this is just the opposite. If you want to get R prime E or REJ, it would just be 26 millivolts over the value of IE. So if we do it with conductance, we would have 875 microamps divided by 26 millivolts, and we would get a conductance of 0 0.0337. And of course the 26 millivolts is just the thermal voltage and that's using the the equation developed by Boltzmann. Boltzmann's constant. So we're just looking at the the random motion of electrons and it's going to give us 26 millivolts. And we have 0 0.0337 
or 33.7 milli siemens. If we wanted to use R prime E, we would take our 26 millivolts and divide that by 875 micro and we would get 29.71 ohms. To get the gain of the circuit, if we use conductance, we would have 33.7 milli siemens times 1.2 k ohms. And notice that I'm using a potentiometer in this case for RC. And I did that because I decided oh, I want to see how I can prove at least the the first two tenets of Barkhausen's criterion. And so I started out with a 1.2 k ohm, and then I decided well, I'll just put a potentiometer in here. So the uh, or the decade resistance box, and the resistance box right now is set to 1.2 k, so this is a good good value. Anyways, when we plug this in we are going to get a gain of 40.44. So any voltage that's coming into our base or into the circuit is going to be 40.44 times bigger over here on the emitter. If we had done it using the values for resistances, and remember that resistance would be just RC divided by or prime E, and that would give you AV as well. So if I have 1,200 ohms and I divide it by, what did we say, 29.71, and I get 40.39, so it's practically the same thing, just a little bit of rounding. So we'll use that 40.44. So we should have 40.44 as the gain of the circuit. Now, we have to remember that we have an attenuation in the device as well and right now the actual amplification of our circuit is going to be the 33.7 milli siemens times 1.2 k and then we're going to multiply that by our attenuation factor which was 0.14 Two, four. So that's going to give us the actual amount of gain that we have that'll get this circuit going or that the circuit is operating at right now. So if we have everything right we should see a approximate value for a sine wave out well a value as far as the frequency so we should see roughly 250 kilohertz at our output it should look like a sine wave and the amplitude is unknown. One of the problems with using a Colpitts design in this transistor circuit, and especially with a common emitter like we're using here, is that it is difficult to find out what your actual voltage out is going to be. Frequency is easy. That's just this equation right here. Well, this one right here. Amplitude is pretty hard. It's easier to do it with a common base or a common collector, but even then it's kind of a hit or miss thing. Uh, percentage wise, you know, you can be pretty far off. So it's easiest quite often just to go ahead and simulate this in something like uh, LT Spice or Multisim and, and get the results for what the circuit would, would do. The, the computations are, are, are pretty lengthy, and this is just a, you know, a way to get a, a good frequency out but an unknown amplitude. So this is the easier way to do it and it will work and you're going to see that it does. Well at least I hope it will work. Let's kick some electrons in the arse and see them run through the circuit and find out if it works the way we expect it to. And here is the circuit that we're going to test. These are these large caps here. This is a C5. This one is C6. This is C4 and this one is C3. These are all just to block any DC from getting into, well, these two are for blocking DC. They prevent DC from getting into my my tank circuit. If any DC did get into it, I could end up saturating the inductor and it doesn't do very good when it's already maxed out because I put a DC on it. 
and of course this is the output this is preventing DC from go getting to my output which I have nothing hooked up to so I could just as well have just left that out and this is the bypass capacitor for the emitter resistor this is RE so this is bypassing RE to get us that that gain this is RB2 this is our 10k ohm resistor and this is RB1 this is our 47k ohm resistor and if everything has gone correctly I've already applied voltage you can hear the the blower motors going in the back I should have about 1.75 volts on the base of my transistor so 1.67 that's close enough and the emitter should have just over one volt so I'm a little bit higher there uh, the base to emitter voltage drop is is lower than we had anticipated but that's all right it's still going to work out for us and let's go ahead and see how it is doing on the oscope well good news we do have a sine wave ish kind of signal one of the problems with this transistor coal pits oscillator is that the uh, the waveform is it's pretty hideous but it is a very stable frequency so let's go ahead and measure that frequency and see what we have and we said we should have 248.13 obviously we're not going to get that close on the scope but we're looking at about 254 or 255 kHz so that's pretty good we also have a decent output and if we measure the amplitude we'd see we have 3.44 and that's that's a satisfactory value well let's try something else and see how Barkhausen really does work out so what I'll do is I'm going to take my decade box and start dropping the voltage and I know it's not going to work if I go down to 200 ohms. There's just not enough amplification in here now. Remember that RC divided by RE or RC times GM gives us the the gain and if RC is really low and the conductance is only 0.035 we're never going to get that gain of 1. So we'll start out by setting it to 200 and then we'll increase it by by tens and I'm going to increase the sensitivity so I can actually see that something is happening and go to 230 and still nothing and 240 we did get a signal so I'm going to go back down and then ramp it up by single digits and there we go so we've got oscillation at 233 ohms and it's not a particularly big signal and this is about as far down as my scope will go and I'm picking up all kinds of nasty noise and jitter uh, the signal is just too small but the this is the point where oscillation did begin albeit not particularly well so let's go back to that calculation to see if we were close to the Barkhausen criterion which said that we should have a amplification times a feedback which is going to be equal to one and actually it's going to be greater than one so let's take a look at that when we originally looked at the circuit we had our decade box set to 1.2k and we can deduce what the gain of the circuit would be from that because we have uh, RC times our GM that's our conductance value so multiply these two together you get the gain and then this is the attenuation well Barkhausen said that to get a circuit to oscillate you should have something that's equal to one well, Barkhausen was partly correct, but Nyquist had some other things to say about that. You actually can run the circuit with a gain much greater than one. Barkhausen was correct in saying that it had to be at least one. And Nyquist went a little bit farther, and there's a few other smart fellows out there that, that amplified or uh, increased the, the, the body of knowledge in this and said, well, the gain can be greater than one, but there is a limit. You can make it so large that you actually start adding harmonics to the circuit so there is a limit in the amount of gain right now let's look at what the gain was when we originally set the circuit up so we had 33.7 millisiemens 
in our original circuit and 1.2 K and our feedback factor was 1424 and this gave us a circuit gain of 5.76 so we had 5.76 for the AV so if Barkhausen was right ab about everything uh, above a gain of one saturating uh, well he wasn't you can see that we worked quite well at 5.76 gain and we got a good output so you have to take a few other things into account including Nyquist and and like I can briefly mention some other smart guys out there let's see what if he was right though about the gain having to be at least equal to one to get the circuit to oscillate and we did that by adjusting our decade box to 233 ohms so let me give myself a little bit more space to work up here so we had our 33.7 milli siemens and our feedback factor was 1424 and our resistance was 233 ohms and now plugging those in we get 0 0.0337 times 0.1424 times 233 and we get 1.118 1 for our gain so greater than or equal to one well he said equal to one but you can see that we came pretty close and you have to remember that we have some some other resistances that are in the circuit nothing is ideal so that's going to cut down a little bit on on the efficiency and we're going to have to you know just punch a little little extra juice through there to get those electrons flowing so hopefully you found the video useful i always enjoy making them because i learned something new and some things that i haven't thought about in in many 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 years such as uh nyquist and colpitz oscillators so until next time uh thank you again for watching and I hope to hear from you if you have any comments and let me know if you want to see anything and take care.